The fire initially started at around midday on the 18th of May 2020 um, and the initial crews that arrived were from our on-call stations at Beer Regis and at Wareham um, and they quickly realised that this was what we call a wind-driven fire so it was gathering pace quite quickly and much like it is today the weather conditions were very hot so the, the ground was very dry and it took hold quite quickly so over the course of two or three hours um, the fire jumped over the road and at that point we made uh, an assistance message we call it so we asked the incident commander at the time asked for 25 fire engines to attend which um, instigated our major incident procedures so at that point really it was around that point that we realised the scale of the incident and that it would become a protracted incident. Yeah, it was really interesting. On the day, the, the scale was difficult. I mean, I've been to quite a few forest fires and initially it, it, it looked like it was going to be achievable to, to extinguish this one. Um, but with the wind, a similar day to today, really, really dry conditions, very, very windy. And it, it just, the winds just took the fire. I mean, it was very, very quickly away from us um, and, you know, heading off through the fire. I mean, the total length that was covered by the fire was three kilometres. Um, we had a really experienced crew with us that day, but none of us had experienced a fire that moved with the same vigour and the same speed as that one. Everything that could be mobilised was mobilised on those first few days of the fire. Um, but even that and everything we could throw at it was really stretched and was, was close to not being enough. There was everything we could find and everything our neighbouring fire authorities could find for us was going to struggle to put the fire out because that was just an area bigger than any of us had encountered before burning and also all burning incredibly fiercely and incredibly powerfully. The chief impact really for Dorset Police was on resourcing um, and there was a, a number of factors that come into play there. One, it was a large area. Uh, it required um, officers 24 hours a day to provide road closures, cordons, uh, and, and you're looking at perhaps three or four officers per shift uh, were being abstracted from their normal duties to do that. So many fire and rescue services got involved. I'm so grateful to them. The, the experience that we received by our fire and rescue service from our neighbours, Devon, Somerset, Hampshire, but some coming from Wales um, and, and other specialists coming from all over the country. One of, one of the things on the actual fire day was, was obviously highlighting to sec sector commanders where there were properties on the boundaries, because it's not always obvious. When you're in the forest, it's, you, you've got trees all around. Um, even where you think it's quite open, there's, there's trees in the distance. Um, and certainly in the, on the afternoon of the fire, the fire was heading straight for a couple of properties that are just off the forest boundary. There were some real fears from local residents. We, when we were relocated to go and protect farms and houses, when we arrived there, they were doing everything they could themselves, but they were already packing their vehicles to leave. They'd already realised that the fire was advancing towards them incredibly quickly, and our resources were stretched so thinly that there was nobody there from the fire service to, to really take the action that they needed. Um, at its peak, we had uh, over 250 firefighters here, um, as well as other agencies and other resources. So as the incident commander, it was a, um, a big task to be able to coordinate where all of those resources were and make sure that they were all safe. Um, that was, I was here for three days and other members of my team then also helped with the reptile rescue that, that took place afterwards. So that's another element of, of the work that, that we would do after a large incident. I just felt totally devastated. And the area that I was working in, um, I couldn't see the, the whole area and, and later towards the, the end of the day when I was sort of going back and I, I went over the brow of the hill and actually saw the, the actual size of it and the devastation, it was quite, um, it was just, just shocking really. So it's all, all really quite upsetting just to see all that destruction. You realise that it's, it's something that's so preventable. You know, for me personally, I, I couldn't get away from it even when I was off duty because I, I, live, I live in Poole. And from where I live in Poole, I could actually see the smoke plume. So that's just a, a measure of how impactful it was. It really was um, one which took weeks and weeks and weeks um, of manpower and not just fire and rescue services. This involved those who were really concerned about the, the devastation to the environment, the animals who were caught up in the fire. Um, and I saw when I visited the fire just one day on, um, being very careful, um, how people were trying to rescue animals um, from from the uh, the, the site. Um, it, it truly was incredible. 
we lost a lot of wildlife, there's no question. And, and it will take 20 to 30 years for that, that heathland structure to, to redevelop. So the, the key way that Dorset Council are looking at preventing this kind of uh, emergency happening again and this kind of incident is through education. And with that, we've been working with local stakeholder groups, uh, including the local supermarkets, retailers, parish councils and other groups in order to educate the public on the causes and the, the risks that they actually open up when they leave barbecues and don't dispose of them properly. We're working to, to get the messages out to visitors that, that come to the Heathlands that actually, you know, it's really risky in, in um, dry weather to have barbecues and it's actually illegal to have barbecues on Heathlands. So we're raising the knowledge through a, a media campaign. We're putting out banners and, and using social media to kind of get those messages across. So that's one thing that, that we're, we're doing. Um, we're also uh, got, got a um, comprehensive education uh, program that we work with the, the fire service on as well. So we're delivering that into schools to help educate and make people aware of, of the issues and, and the risks. At the, at the recent cabinet uh, meeting, we decided that we would ban all uh, disposable barbecues on any land that we actually own that is in high risk areas. We're also looking at working with a number of people as to how we can educate the public on the dangers of disposable barbecues. We're not trying to ruin their fun. What we're trying to do is come up with a constructive way in which we can all work together uh, and working with third parties, other stakeholders, to, to try and get the message across that disposing of a barbecue is absolutely crucial if we, wish, if we wish to protect the environment in which we live in. We've got some wonderful places to visit and go to in Dorset and Wiltshire, but please just bring a picnic, heat it up at home in the oven, but bring a picnic, not a barbecue. You know, barbecues are not permitted within the forest and we're trying to, to, to get, get people to understand that, you know, come and enjoy the forest. It's a beautiful place. You know, it's a wonderful habitat and we would actively encourage people to come in and enjoy those, that habitat. But bring a picnic. Don't, don't bring a barbecue.